Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this, the fifth of the 2011-2012 Frontiers of Astronomy Lecture Series. This lecture series is brought to you by the Department of Astronomy at Case Western Reserve University with the support of the Arthur S. Holden Senior Endowment, the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, our host here, and the Cleveland Astronomical Society. I'm Earl Luck. I'm associated with the Department of Astronomy at Case, and I'm also the organizer of this, so if you have ideas of speakers, send me some email. Yes, I know. <laughs> okay, so this is going to be a very interesting talk tonight, I feel. Alan McConaughey over here is a graduate of Cambridge University, or the University of Cambridge, however you want to say it. Uh, he went from there to British Columbia to Victoria as a, uh, what is it, uh, Commonwealth Science Fellowship Fellow, and from there moved, well, a couple yards, uh, to the Institute of Astron Astrophysics there. Um, and what he does is some of the most spectacular imaging of the local group of galaxies, and in particular some Im just fantastic images of the Andromeda Galaxy that I've ever seen. Um, you all have this image of the Andromeda Galaxy being a rather small thing up in the sky. If you actually take an optical image of it, it's about equivalent to about, oh, six diameters of the full moon. Uh, but the actual galaxy is much, much, much larger than that. And so what he's going to talk about tonight is using the local group and the properties of the stars within the local group to do cosmology. It's a field called near-field cosmology. And you didn't come here to hear me talk about this, so, Alan? Thank you, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, as you probably guessed from the introduction in my accent, I'm not a native of the United States. Uh, I come from Scotland, so hopefully you will understand my accent. Uh, let me <laughs> see somebody applauding there. Excellent. Um, yeah, so what I want to talk today about um, is near-field cosmology. Now, that's a very fancy term. It's a, a phrase which astronomers love to use when they're writing grants because it sounds nice and sexy and you can get, can get lots of money from that. Um, however, what is it? This here is a picture of the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. Many of you may have seen this picture before. It's a very famous picture in astrophysics. Uh, basically, the Hubble Space Telescope took a very, very deep image to see very, very faint objects of effect effectively just a pinprick of sky, you know, a pinhead of sky. And this is what you see if you look hard enough. Um, it's rather spectacular. Um, more or less, almost every single one of those images, not quite, but almost every single one of those pictures you see is a galaxy. Um, a vast variety of galaxies, literally thousands of galaxies. All of those galaxies are incredibly far away. Some of them are so far away that essentially because of the finite light travel time, it takes a little while for light to travel between distances. And when those distances are very large, that time can be very long. So the most distant objects there, you basically see in these galaxies as they were many billions of years ago. In some cases, soon after when we think there was an event called the Big Bang. But the point is a very, very long time ago. Some of them are a little bit closer, and some of them are a bit closer still. So you're effectively seeing snapshots of the lives of galaxies. Some of them are middle-aged, some of them are very young, some of them are very old. And there's a vast variety there, are vast, the different shapes, different colors, etc. And you can get a lot of detailed information from them. However, there's one galaxy that, that, that is there um, that you're getting more detail in and the potential to actually find out more about than any single other galaxy there. And uh, that galaxy is represented by that single star there. And there's about two or three other stars there. Those stars are in our galaxy, okay, the Milky Way galaxy. We are seeing the Milky Way galaxy, the one that we live in, effectively, you know, the, our Cleveland, if you like, the city that we live in, with about 100 or so billion stars in it. That's just one of them. Okay, and this, uh, somebody was counting the stars earlier, actually. There's about four or five stars there. Okay, all of those belong to the Milky Way. The Milky Way, though, remember, has about 100 billion stars, all of which we can see in incredible detail. Not only can we see that they're there, not only can we measure their colors, we can also start looking at how they're moving. We can start looking at what gives them their color, what is the chemistry of those stars. And you can do it for every single one of them. 
The difference, however, when we actually analyze this galaxy is we are seeing it as it is now. Okay, and the fact that we can see this galaxy as it is now means that the way we try to understand that galaxy is fundamentally different from all of these galaxies which we're seeing as they were. Okay, what we have to do is try to use the information we can gather in those stars to reassemble what the formation of the Milky Way looked like. Okay, because things take a long time in astronomy. Distances are very large. Uh, stars take a very long time to evolve billions of years. So therefore, the information about how our galaxy was put together is, if you like, encoded uh, in the DNA, that is the stars. So in some respects, this is a form of archaeology uh, because we're essentially looking at things as they are now, basically things which have clues as to how the Milky Way was put together, to try to figure out how was the Milky Way put together. And this is a very complementary uh, way of studying galaxies too perhaps a more traditional way of looking at distant galaxies and seeing snapshots in time and trying to figure things out from there. Because remember, the more distant galaxies, we can't see the stars. We just see the total amount of light all those stars emit. But to get the really detailed view, you want to get, analyze stars. Uh, so in some respects, archaeology, um, I have a likeness for Harrison Ford, so I think. Uh, nobody else seems to think that. I have no idea, do, I have no idea why that is. Um, this subtitle, Unearthing Artifacts, uh, of galaxy cannibalism uh, will be made clear to you uh, later on. One of the interesting things, however, was uh, one time I work uh, officially the Hertzberg Institute of Astrophysics as part of the government of Canada, and we were putting together a press release about a discovery which we'd made in which we used the term galaxy cannibalism. And this was actually removed by somebody who works in the press release department for the government of Canada because cannibalism is not something that Canada wishes to associate itself with. Um, <laughs> So, you know, uh, never mind. Hopefully you'll understand what I mean by that uh, as this goes on. So just starting off at the basics, obviously I expect there's a, there's a broad spread of knowledge uh, in the audience regarding galaxies, stars, and such like. Our home, home galaxy is the Milky Way. Okay, now the, the Milky Way is, we believe, a spiral galaxy, uh, something like what you see here. The problem with studying the Milky Way, however, is you get incredibly detailed information, but we're inside the Milky Way. Okay, so looking out and trying to figure out uh, what everything is, what, where everything is, how far away things are, can we see behind all of these things. It's like trying to figure out uh, what does Cleveland look like if you're in downtown. Looking around you, there's buildings in the way, you don't quite know what's going on. Um, and so therefore, our projection of what the Milky Way looks like is obviously very different. You can see there a picture of what we see as the Milky Way uh, in the night sky when it's very dark where you're basically looking towards the sort of central regions of the galaxy and you're seeing all of the diffuse light that comes from all of the many billions of stars that are in the disk of our galaxy. And we're approximately towards the edge of this main disk of stars. So there's two types of galaxies or two broad, and this is being very broad classifications of galaxies. Um, astronomers are not the most creative of people when it comes to naming things. So this big galaxy that looks like an, an ellipse, we call an elliptical galaxy. Um, that's essentially featureless um, when you just look at the main light. It's essentially just a big ball of stars. Okay, it's just like, yeah, a big ball of stars. We call it elliptical galaxies. And the other ones which I just uh, described are, of course, uh, spiral galaxies, disk galaxies. Uh, very often, stars which you have this compressed disk there, you see an edge on view of it. Um, very often, that disk has a spiral pattern just to do with how the stars are moving around. Uh, so spiral galaxies or disk galaxies effectively refer to the same things. So these are the two main types. However, there are also a lot more. You know, this is just a sort of broad, sort of separating it by eye into different classifications. Uh, and there are also some much more irregular looking things. Uh, these are the antennae galaxies. Here on the left, you see um, a big image of sort of a, a larger part of the galaxy. And in the central, the rest of the image is a blow up of the very central region there taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. And I mean, that's a dramatic picture of stuff going on. Okay, what is that stuff that's going on? Well, we believe what we're seeing here is lots of star, uh, lots of gas and dust uh, basically colliding together and making stars. Because what, how we think actually a galaxy like this, which is incredibly strange, irregular looking galaxies, so we call this general type just irregular galaxies, what we think is actually going on is that this is actually two galaxies, two disk galaxies, like two Milky Ways, which have collided together 
in a certain way, because things like to collide together, because gravity is, of course, the only force that's really significant uh, in astronomy over long distances. These things are very, very massive. And it turns out that if you smash together two spiral galaxies in a very specific way, you can actually produce something that looks not too dissimilar at all to the broad idea of what we're seeing in the antennae. Uh, galaxy, okay? You have these two sort of nice wings coming out. So that sort of makes sense. That's kind of, you know, that's a picture that, okay, we can understand. Because, of course, galaxies also have gas in them. When, all, when these galaxies collide together, all of that gas is what forms new stars. And all of the shocks as you, as you smash two clouds of gas together triggers new star formation. And that's what produces these beautiful uh, color images here that you see in all of this activity going on in the central regions. Further though, I said, you know, here we've just seen two galaxies collide together. Quite frankly, all gal galaxies at some level are grouping together, are close together to each other, okay? So actually collisions may not actually be that uncommon. Here we're seeing a picture of a cluster of galaxies. Okay, here you have, I think it's many hundreds in this image uh, of different galaxies. Many of them look fairly elliptical type, but you can see that they're all very close together. They're all effectively moving around one another um, and you can also see some other features which don't look quite like galaxies, which look like streaks. Uh, that's act actually to do with something about what happens uh, when so many galaxies, which are so massive, get together in a cluster of galaxy, get, get together in a cluster. Actually, the mass is strong enough to do something called lensing. So it actually likes, acts like a lens uh, to focus light. I won't go into that, but the point is, um, you can see there's a wealth of, it, of stuff going on here again because galaxies like to group together because gravity pulls things together. Okay, and that's an important uh, point for understanding how is it galaxies look the way they do? What is actually going on? When you look at much larger scales, so this is from uh, a survey called the SDSS, Sloan Digital Sky Survey, in which there's uh, people involved in this audience uh, who work up at CASE. Um, this is actually just a map of where galaxies are in the nearby universe. We are at the very center, and as you go out in some direction, basically a, a point just indicates that there's a galaxy there. You can see immediately that when we are talking about galaxies, galaxies are not just smoothly, smoothly spread about through space. Um, they're not, it's not just like a smooth ocean of galaxies or anything like that. Instead, they group together, they cluster together, they form structures. Okay, and they form structures of many different scales from just small groups of galaxies through to much larger clusters of galaxies, super clusters of galaxies. Between clusters, you actually have filaments joining them, and there's a vast variety of structure. Again, this is all due to gravity, and I'll show you how we actually think this sort of structure forms in the first place. This is a computer simulation, excuse me while I drink, of the universe. Um, the only thing you need to take away from this is it's big. Uh, the numbers are irrelevant. Um, but again, this is, is, this is not quite the distribution of galaxies. This is close to, and we can talk about it in question time if you want. Uh, but this is effectively the sort of structure that forms in the universe as a result just of gravity. Gravity is wanting to pull things together into all of these vast array of, you know, incredibly beautiful things uh, that we call galaxies, clusters of galaxies, and such like. This keeps on zooming in, and you see that basically on all scales, whether it was on the very biggest scale, whether it's on this now as we're getting into the central regions, things still look pretty similar. Okay, things don't look a lot different on smaller scales as they do on bigger scales. And that's because gravity doesn't have a size it prefers. It acts everywhere in the same way. We now get down to this kind of scale. This kind of scale, sorry, I keep wanting to walk away from the microphone. And it's hard for me to stand in one place. Um, what, on this sort of scale, what we're talking about now is a group of galaxies. Specifically, let's talk about our group of galaxies called the local group. Again, not the most imaginative name uh, that was ever created. This map, it's not incredibly uh, attractive, but it shows you some of the galaxies that are in our immediate vicinity. 